Hello and welcome. In this episode of My Time with Radha, Swami Shivananda shares stories of his time with Swami Radha as her personal driver and student. We discuss how personal, familial, and societal expectations are challenged on the path of yoga and the value of surrender during difficult times. Hi, Swami Shivananda. Hello, namaste. And so the first question I have for you is, how did you first get involved with Yashodra Ashram? What was that process like and what were kind of the first glimpses of the teachings um, that you received? How did it all start? Well, it uh, started in the late 70s. I had been exploring different aspects of yoga with different teachers through the early 70s, and quite intensely with some. I went to uh, solstices that were specifically oriented towards yogic teaching, and I had started a, a daily practice by that time. I had this, um, well, there were two factors. I had this feeling, because both of my teachers, of my substantial teachers, before I met Swami Radha, were men from the East. So I was, I had this idea already that there was some kind of cultural overlay on what I was being, what I was able to understand. And I was kind of intuitively or just a, a suspicion that if I could just sort of lift that uh, uh, cultural overlay, the Eastern cultural overlay, I would be able to see more clearly what the teachings were. And of course, that's exactly what happened with uh, Swami Radha. And so that was one theme. I was, I continued to look. I was absorbed in what I was learning and with the teachers I had. But I had this kind of um, idea in the back of my mind that there's a little bit more I could be taught or come to understand. And the other thing was that my partner, uh, Patricia at the time, was not at all enamored with the first teacher I had, the first system of teachings, which was more Sikh-oriented. It just wasn't her thing. It was quite vigorous physically, for one thing. And then the second one, the teacher only came to Ottawa for a week, and then uh, left, and I continued on a correspondence course with his group, and um, she wasn't interested in doing that. So there was this also this idea in the back of my mind that maybe we could find something we could both enjoy. And then I saw a poster in a shop here in Ottawa about this Yashodra ashram teacher in Ottawa. That was Nancy Lullitz, one of the earlier certified teachers from the ashram. And she had a house on Sunnyside, and she taught out of her home Hatha Yoga, and more importantly for me was the Kundalini Yoga part, as I came to know it through her. And the poster also mentioned that a, a woman by the name of Swami Radha was coming to Ottawa for a weekend workshop. So, I was quite interested in that. I went to talk to Nancy. She had just come back. It was, uh, was it the fall? I guess it was the fall. She had just come back from spending the summer at the ashram. So we met, and I started classes with her, along with Patricia. And then shortly after that, within a month or so, uh, Swami Radek came to Ottawa for one of her regular annual visits. I did the Music and Consciousness uh, workshop with Swami Radha. So that's how it all started. I went out to the ashram shortly after that workshop, uh, just for a weekend. I was on a trip to Vancouver anyway, so I stopped off in the ashram, in the ashram on my way home, 
did a little bit of karma yoga for a weekend. That's how it all started. Wow. So you got a taste of the ashram and a taste of Swami Radha qu quite quickly after becoming introduced to, to her and the teachings. Yes. Yes, that's right. And of course, the music and consciousness kind of uh, challenged my concept of yoga. Up to that point, I had been doing very traditional, well, traditional, I guess is a good word, yoga asanas and things like that, and being exposed to some of the different teachings related to those in the Sikh tradition and in the second teacher, Swami Chinmayananda, the Vedantic approach and the Vedantic uh, philosophy. But music and consciousness wasn't even within the realm of my thinking when it came to yoga. And, of course, that was made itself quite evident of how relevant it was uh, shortly after that workshop. Wow. And, yeah, so already, like, you're being a little bit disoriented from what you kind of thought you knew about yoga yeah. and then this new approach. Um, what Do you remember, like, your main takeaways? I mean, I know it was a long time ago, but even just like a sense of your first reaction to Swami Radha, your first impressions. Oh, yes. Th that first workshop was held in Nancy Mullitz's house, as were all the workshops and things I had done with Nancy. And I remember we were sitting downstairs. It was sort of an open concept house, and Swami Radha came down the stairs. I hope this uh, comes across correctly, but uh, I was a bit surprised. She appeared initially when I saw her coming down the stairs as a fairly um, ordinary, if I could say, woman, except for her eyes. I was quite taken with her eyes. And uh, then the workshop began and a whole other side became evident. And of course, she was my first uh, significant female teacher. And I was quite impressed, but it was her eyes that caught my attention. Her eyes. Yeah, I know from that, there's that, you know, classic photo of her with kind of the orange background and she's smiling. It's it's all over the ashram and the different different time prayer rooms. And I think there's even like an enlarged version of it in the dining hall at the ashram too. That photo, her eyes are Wherever you look at it from, it's, it feels like she's really looking back. And so I can't even imagine looking in those eyes in real life and, and let alone for the first time at such a workshop. Yeah. Well, the, it, you know, there's an intensity there in that photograph you're describing. There's an intensity there. But also, clearly to me, is this compassion, or if that's too big a word, just incredible kindness that comes through. Anyway, that was my first exposure to her. I think that was around 1977. Wow, 1977. And then how did things develop from there? So you mentioned you went to the ashram for a short visit and then came, I assume you came back to Ottawa. Um, yes. How did things continue? Well, I continued... Um, both Patricia and I continued with Nancy Mullitz, and we became quite involved in the work here. Nancy held not only daily classes in her home, she also had larger sort of community classes and different workshops, uh, which people going to the ashram would be quite familiar with today. I mentioned Music for Consciousness. Uh, we did others. I think it was quite a while later, we did a life seal and things like that. And that brought in a larger community of people here. There was always kind of a core group, this larger group. And I, my interest continued to develop, and Patricia and I started making plans to go to the ashram for the summer. At that time, the ashram had a summer program that if you took it in two consecutive years, it was six weeks each, and it was often thought of as the equivalent or something that would be similar to the yoga development course, which was called in those days the yoga teacher's course. So we signed up for the six-week course in the summer of 1980, 
and uh, made a commitment to come back the next summer in 1981 for the second six-week session. Then things just rolled along from there. We continued to have workshops with Nancy here in Ottawa. Swami Radha returned sometimes twice a year, but at least once a year. And it moved along from there. I signed up for the YDC, the winter YDC, in 1983. So 1982 was kind of a year of preparation for that. Wow. And I would imagine like in those years, quite early on still, that Swami Radha played a very active role in teaching in the YDC, or, or perhaps not. What was that like? Well, she wasn't teaching as much as she had been. The people who had taken the YDC before I did in 1983 uh, would have had more classes with Swami Radha there. She always kept a close track of what was happening, and the teachers were that I had in 1983 were very, very good. So by the time I took the YDC officially in 83, I had actually done a lot of the workshops before that in the two summer sessions, some of them with Nancy here in Ottawa. Mm. So you had a good background stepping into the YDC, because I know, at least in my year, there was people who had never even been to the ashram or hadn't done any classes coming in and committing themselves to the three months, but it sounds like you had some sort of foundation. Yes, I did. It wasn't common in the early days for people to be introduced for the first time to the teachings through the YDC. There was uh, an expectation that was made clear that somebody do a course first so that they knew what they were getting into. And the most common thing as I remember, was that people were encouraged to take the 10 days of yoga before taking the YDC, and many people did. Yeah, and now the 10 days of yoga, I think it's the yoga journey course. That's right. That happens, I think, three times a year, which gives people, gives folks a lot of opportunity. Yes. So you've met Swami Radha, you've been connected for, I mean, my math I, is so horrible for, I have to use my fingers, for seven years. Um what is a is there like a memory that you had that you shared with her during those times um, that comes out for you? Interspersed in these visits she would have here to Ottawa, um, she would be coming here as part of a a larger tour through Canada and what I knew her it was mostly in the northern states. So several times I drove her from Ottawa to Toronto, where she had a larger following there, so I got to know her as her driver. <laughs> and that was really a gift because it's very easy, I find, to talk uh, in a car because you know we're sitting side by side, both looking straight ahead, and I'm busy with the driving. And so the the conversation seems to flow easily. And a lot of those drives were times when I got to appreciate Swami Radha in a much broader sense than a person leading a workshop. I think it, it's fair to say that eventually we became friends. It was a, an easy relationship that developed there. Many years later, when I was more intensely involved with her, it was sort of like um, an ideal introductory time. Those first moments with her of driving around from Ottawa to Ontario, yeah. Um, Ottawa to Toronto. To Toronto. Yeah. And then later, I, uh, when I was living at the ashram after the YDC in 1983, I spent quite a bit of time as her driver and assistant, more generally, when she was teaching uh, in Calgary and uh, Edmonton. In Vancouver, and then we spent quite a bit of time in California. Wow, yeah. I, well, I had heard, um, I think from, from you personally, of your kind of relationship and your position as her personal driver for many of the years that um, you were kind of very active, and, and she was... she was your guru and your teacher, but and you were... you had that role of... Um, of her personal driver. How did that develop? Well, it happened 
quite um, slowly and naturally. I was available. Other people feel, fulfilled that role, but they were often people who were quite busy at the ashram. Um, the ashram community was much smaller in those days, and so people were multitasking even more than they are now. And as a new person moving to the ashram, and then in addition, somebody that knew Swami Radha, I bet it wasn't entirely a new experience for me. It just happened very naturally and easily that I was, you know, would, would I go to Lethbridge or to Calgary or to Edmonton and drive Swami Radha, look, make sure her meals were looked after, uh, things like that. And as I said before, what started off as a very pleasant but easygoing friendship developed in those trips to something that was much more to me. And I think she was comfortable with me, and that made quite a difference. She said so at one point. I remember driving out of the ashram, and um, she was getting herself sorted out in the front seat with how things that she brought with her, and said, you know, it was very comfortable for her to have me driving her. Uh, that was good for me to hear. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. Now, I must say there were other factors here. Uh, it wasn't just as I've described. My wife at the time, Patricia, had developed cancer rather quickly just the week before I left for the 1983 yoga development course. And our we both moved to the ashram uh, later that summer. In retrospect, I think it was um, also in Swami Radha's mind to um, give me an opportunity, opportunities away from the ashram where Patricia was. And uh, that may have been a, a motive more than anything. She used everything to teach. Every, every day, every situation almost was a opportunity to teach. And so my situation and my anxiety about Patricia's health was uh, a major emotional issue for me, and I didn't know how to handle it very well. I don't think anybody uh, is proficient in that. It takes a lot of practice. And so I was on the fast track in a way. Swami Radha would challenge some of my emotional responses. I can give one example. I, during the YDC, Patricia had gone into the hospital just before I had left. The seriousness of the cancer became evident when, during the first month, I was at the ashram taking the YDC. And there was, um, I felt, a lot of pressure to go back and try and support her the way I, any way I could. And um, I also felt that that was the right thing to do um, in my role as her partner. And I remember at one point uh, talking to Swami Radha about returning to Ottawa. And of course, that would have meant uh, stopping my YDC process, or at least interrupting it seriously. So I was, uh, as you might imagine, quite keen to go home and do what I could. Now, this is where I say that she took every situation that was before her to teach. And I remember once standing outside the uh, bookstore, which was in Sheba Hall, and I was telling her I was thinking of going home and that's what I wanted. And she said, boy, you sacrificed quite a bit in getting here, and now you want to go home. And she said, and tell me, Don, that was my name then, what exactly will you do when you go home that isn't already being done? I said, well, and I started to try and answer, and I was scrambling because I didn't quite know. And she said, well, do you have any uh, training in... Uh, care for people who are seriously ill? No. And do you have anything unique to offer that other people can't, apart from your emotions? 
And I said, mm, no. And she said, well, why would you go? What is it you're actually doing? What is the motive here? I'm saying this all in a very quiet way, but she was very assertive. I felt she was taking me right to the edge of something um, to help me understand um, how powerful emotions were. Now, I didn't articulate that in my head that way at the time, but I did very quickly afterwards. And that talk was sufficient to delay my departure quite a bit. I did eventually go home for a week and then came back and finished the YDC. But I think that little vignette there of requiring me to think more deeply, to be more disciplined in my uh, thinking process, and to recognize the power of emotions to change my mind and to become a motivator and a highly questionable one at that because I didn't really understand my emotions uh, at the time. So there's a good example of teachings in the moment and very powerfully d delivered. She was certainly speaking with me in a way that nobody else that I know of would have even thought of doing at the time. I think I was in that same mindset of, well, rush home as quickly as you can and do something, all motivated by strong emotions, but not understanding the full reach or the full power of that emotional response. And of course, some of it is just um, also just playing a role, right? It's what was expected of me uh, by my parents, by Patricia's parents, by my friends. That's what the kind, considerate thing to do is. But that's unexamined. And when it's examined more closely, we begin to understand what yoga really is, and particularly related to emotions. That stands right at the beginning of Patanjali's sutras on yoga. Yoga is control of the thoughts arising in the mind. That really sticks with me, and that way that Swami Radha would question uh, very courageously, enter into areas of unknown areas of emotional responses, and do so so clearly. I'm grateful to her for that. It was those kinds of short bursts of insight that happened more and more often as we got to know each other in my version of Driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> it was uh, uh, very challenging indeed, and I wasn't always happy about it, and I'm sure I wasn't always as cooperative as um, uh, she would have liked or I would have liked, but I did the best I could. I'm sure she continued to give that knowledge to you. She did. That happened often. I think it's uh, one reason we had such a successful friendship that way, and it added depth to the friendship into the areas that are more traditionally thought of as a teacher-student, a relationship of teaching and learning. Yeah, some real nuance in your relationship. And there's also that aspect, you know, you spoke about her kind of assertiveness. And then I would imagine from your end of that receptivity to what she was telling you throughout the years, and especially in this situation, that, as you said, is so connected to your emotions and those expectations of the role of a, of a partner, of a husband, and the expectations that your parents might have had. And I feel like it's so well, and especially what you said about kind of your response to what she would tell you, I feel like it really well connects with our theme for the day, um, for our talk together, which is the theme of surrender. And I thought I would, before we get into the theme, I thought I would share the quote that I found from Light and Vibration. Swami Radha writes, To follow instructions, you have to surrender. To listen to someone, especially the guru within, 
you have to surrender the merry-go-round of mental conversation in your own head. Otherwise, you will not hear what is said. The word guru does not always refer to a physical human being. The guru, in this case, is the essence, the energy, and the capacity to surrender. I'm, I'm now just thinking, you know, when I when I kind of fa- stumbled upon this quote, cool, I was immediately so drawn into it and thought it would it would really connect with our conversation. But then after what you said about this instance with her and that situation, it so incredibly links with this with this theme. Yes, yes, it does. And for me, if it having that example that I just spoke about was the beginning of several incidents somewhat like that, where that ability to listen in the way she's describing here, the guru within, starts to get tested and uh, updated. Because so many of these things that we carry, I carried anyway, in my head were unconsciously planted there. The idea of being with somebody that I cared about when they were ill, and I don't mean just with a cold, this was serious, the medical professional uh, were not at all optimistic. So there was a very serious concern to Patricia's life from this cancer. Now, let me extend this a little bit with another example. No sooner had Patricia and I uh, settled in at the ashram, we moved there in summer of 83, I got a phone call from an old colleague asking me if I would come to Alaska for a a review that he had been asked to do. This fellow was a judge looking into the implementation of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. don't want to go into a lot of detail of that. but So here's a, a somewhat similar example. I very much respected this person, but I told him on the phone that I couldn't and that I had just moved to the ashram. This was a long-time goal of mine to live in a place like the ashram. And uh, my wife was very, very seriously ill, and I just couldn't pick up and leave. So that was a phone call somewhere around the end of August of 1983. No well, sooner I I hung up the phone and I was walking down the path towards main house and Swami Radha was walking up the path. It's a very narrow path, as you know. So I stopped and she stopped. We talked and she was asking me what I was doing and I mentioned this phone call. And she said, well, why did you say no? And I remember the feeling of that. It's just what I said. You know, I had finally moved to the ashram. Uh, I had finally got to a place where I thought if anything was going to help, uh, it would be the ashram with Patricia. So it was a good place for me, a good place for her, a good place for us. She looked at me and she said, never, never make a decision until you have all the facts. You don't have all the facts. And of course, I was... um, a little uncomfortable. Um, I, yeah, what are the facts that I haven't got? But I had to admit that I hadn't thought about it seriously. And she said, get the facts and then make a decision. So I went and phoned uh, this gentleman back and I said I would be happy to start this project in Alaska with him. I would come to Vancouver. We could talk about the budget and what would be required, all that kind of thing. Um, so I did. I was on a plane within a couple of days to Vancouver. I was in Alaska within a week. And I didn't um, emerge from Alaska until Christmas. <laughs> but it, it's again, it's this, uh, if I can pick up this uh, theme of surrender, the capacity which I had been slowly um, developing with her of this idea of surrender in the yogic sense. It's not the military sense. (laughs) 
But in the yogic sense, this idea of surrender, of there's a capacity in the mind to just stop and wait and know that that's the most important thing. And uh, she was right. And there's another dimension to this, which I appreciated in the following almost two years when I was in Alaska. Because at Christmas when I came home, it became apparent that she had taken on Patricia's health in a way that was uh, quite significant. And um, she said to me that she felt that Patricia would be fine if she could withstand the pressures or the challenges of getting better that that offered. And I didn't quite understand what she meant, but she said, it's best that you're not here. She will get better faster without you here because she doesn't have you to lean on. She has to face the stark challenge of getting better and all that that means physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And because the two of you are so emotionally codependent, uh, your being here would, would slow that process down. So it's best you're not here. Now, again, sort of like the original story I told, um, that, that is a little hard to hear. It didn't fit with my ideas of caring, of um, certainly of romance, <laughs> and a bunch of other things like that. But she was adamant. She encouraged me to stay in Alaska, which I did for almost two years. That was uh, very challenging. But again, it was a lesson. It was yoga. And it again went to the very root of some of my most strongly rooted emotions and and notions of what it was to be a good person or a responsive partner. And uh, it worked. And I, I don't mean that quite as lightly as I said it, but Swami Radha put in an enormous amount of effort with Patricia to get her to a position where she could heal herself. I only saw a little bit of that myself when I was uh, back at the ashram briefly over those two years, but she went into remission, and then she uh, began to speak about her process, and she actually wrote about it in one of our Ascent magazines, where she challenged people to think about what it would be like to have the best teacher you've ever had the most challenging teacher you ever had, be with you 24-7 through a learning process like this, which is, has to do with self-image, deep, deep-rooted habits, emotional habits, speech habits that uh, perpetuate our self-image, that cut us short of our full potential. To make those kind of changes quickly, and Swami Radha said, she said, this may look a little harsher than you're willing to accept, but she says, I don't have much time, so it has to happen now. And Patricia went into remission by 1986. That was astonishing to me and was further proof that that kind of surrender. Now, I'm talking about me. I can't, even today, I, I find it difficult to even try and describe what Patricia went through. She's written about it herself, and that's available. But she came to admit that the difficulty was what allowed her to turn that whole process around. And the difficulty for me, although it was, by comparison, rather modest, I just had to absent myself <laughs> from... Uh, very, very difficult situation and challenging situation, and my job mainly was to stay away. And I've often thought of that since, how easy it is in a situation where somewhat like that, or was in my case, where a person who is sick spends an inordinate amount of time worrying about their spouse or their children 
or their caretaker to the detriment of their own energies put to getting well. And so the more I studied yoga, and the more, particularly the more I read about yoga theory, yoga philosophy, Eastern philosophy, Eastern psychology, the more I could see that, although very harsh on the first uh, look, there is an enormous amount of compassion involved. It's not emotion, it's not um, soft, it's very hard-edged in many cases, in my experience, but it's effective. I guess the closest I've ever come to seeing something like that in the West uh, is this idea of, what is that, um, hard love? Is that mm. what they, they call it? Tough love. Tough love, there it is, tough love. Through uh, Swami Radha, she kept quite close to me in those years, uh, correspondence and phone calls, and uh, I would sometimes fly down to California from Alaska and meet her for a week or so or less, and she would update me on the process. So I got her take on it, and then years later I got more detailed from Patricia. And it wasn't quite as clean as I'm describing it. It was very messy emotionally. Emotions at cross purposes. And as I was trying to revive my mental emotional habits, making mistakes, and then very difficult interim measures as Swami Radha was trying to help me cope with the situation. For example, early on in the first six or nine months I was in Alaska, Swami Radha asked me not to write to Patricia, not to phone her. I saw the effect on myself very quickly, and I came to see later how that space, though everything else inside me was screaming to do the opposite, I came to see that that was a very key part of Patricia's process as well. This is a uh, surrender 101 in yoga, and I can see how critical that is to understanding ourselves deeply. If we don't understand our emotions and the influence they have, then uh, we don't really know ourselves. And the first challenge in yoga is to truly come to know ourselves. And that can be done theoretically. There's some interesting guidance in the books that I've read, but uh, there is nothing like having a teacher right on your case <laughs> and, uh, and pointing out the, uh, errors or inclinations before you're even aware of it yourself. <laughs> it makes the learning process much, much quicker. Swami Radha said she would teach what she could, what she knew, and she did that with me. And I'm using a very graphic uh, but simple to understand example to explain that. She made a promise to me, and then I, through my initiations, I took that promise on for myself, because I really did have the guidance uh, to know what was required. I know there's something that I, I've heard you speak about a little bit um, before, like prior to this interview of just of just knowing you and um, and kind of knowing your relationship from afar with Swami Radha, and this component of you know around um, the early '90s of her asking you to go to California, I think it was to witness a Bandara, a celebration of life, um, so that so that the ashram would know what to do. Um, at the time of her passing. Can you speak a little bit about that and what that was like to be asked of that and asked of you and um, how it went for you and how it felt? <laughs> well, this makes um, the story can only be told uh, the way I'm going to tell it. Um, but it's all in hindsight because at the time it was a complete mystery of what was going on. I had no idea. Uh, she, she was... Uh, where was she? Was she was down in Spokane? And she phoned one day and asked if I would go down to San Francisco and Prakasha, who lived there, be my partner in this. 
that we were to go to this Bandara that she had been invited to um, as her representatives. A Bandara is a, a celebration of a, a great teacher's life. And so with me, often it's spoken of like a great teacher creates this warehouse full of teachings, of knowledge, of experiences, and passes them on. And so this Bandara, upon the person's death, is kind of an opening of the warehouse of acknowledging how much is available and how much has been given. So it's um, a festival. It's nothing like a funeral. <laughs> I really didn't know this uh, teacher. He was well known in California and further afield. Um, he had a very large following in California that I found out. So here, Prakasha and I, going to this ceremony or this celebration, kind of wide-eyed because we'd never seen anything like it. Singing and dancing and uh, huge amounts of food. And the disciples of the teacher were all people serving the food. Um, symbolically, you know, that's part of it is it's up to the disciples to now pick up the, the nourishment inherent in all this and distribute it to others. So it's a very happy event. She was uh, quite keen that Prakash and I write up what we had learned or seen. And all the time, never even dawned on me that she was trying to show us what an appropriate way might be upon her death to properly honor a teacher in that uh, tradition. So we did. We wrote it up, and uh, that's been a, a model that we've adopted over time uh, after her death. Every year we have a Bandara the 30th of November, which is when she died, and um, we bring back a lot of that kind of symbolic symbolism in the rituals and celebrate rather than be forlorn or uh, grieving. It's not at all what she wanted, and it wasn't. It isn't at all in the yogic uh, tradition either. In surrender, <laughs> yeah. The well, she surrendered a huge amount so that what we have today could be used, fruitfully used. The theme of surrender runs through all of this. Uh, uh, you know, beginning with surrendering our personal preferences and beginning to understand what that really means, not in any spectacular uh, snap, crackle, pop kind of way, just an everyday, quiet way of living in a yogic tradition. Surrender is the key to that. It's a pretty hard concept initially to develop because we're so um, imbued with other meanings of surrender, like giving up. Uh, it's anything but, and to learn what that really means and then being able to bring it forward from our own experience. She pioneered a lot of that for everyone that becomes part of the ashram teaching system. I can't say enough about how grateful I am that I had that time with her. Well, I think that so perfectly communicates that kind of, that power of surrender and all that you've shared has now opened up I feel like I've been like behind a door and every one of these conversations I have on the other side of the door is Swami Radha. And after all these conversations, the door like swings open a little bit and then closes again. Um, and I keep getting more and more glimpses. And so I thank you so much for, for sharing all your stories and, and giving me a new, giving me and the people listening, um, new glimpses of Swami Radha and, and reminding us all of the potential of the teachings um, to help us understand ourselves and the world um, and that that quality of surrender that can be so central to to yoga um, and to our evolution. Thank you, Swami Shivananda. You're most welcome.
Namaste. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. Yashodra Ashram is located on the unceded traditional territory of the Tanaha and Sanaixt peoples. You can learn more about the ashram by visiting our website at yashodra.org. You can also follow us on Instagram and YouTube. Until next time, I'm Katie Taher, and this is My Time with Radha.